Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Paul Gronson, Director of Cloud Strategy and Architecture with Telenor, Lasha Tevitze, Group, Group Chief Digital Operations uh, Manager with Vion, and Brian Klastad, Global Account Manager with Red Hat. So welcome, gentlemen, to, uh, to this discussion. Um, so to, to get the ball rolling, I just wanted to sort of set the scene a little bit. And essentially, as, as I understand it, the idea behind the Netco Servco split is that the, the telco business model can be partitioned into uh, an infrastructure business that offers largely connectivity on a wholesale business. Uh, on a wholesale basis, and um, does that to to multiple customers, uh, and then the other remainder of the business then is a retail services business that serves consumers and enterprises with communication services that that are using that netco side of the business and potentially third party networks, third party infrastructure. Um, and if this separation is is structural, for example, uh, the Netco business is perhaps sold to an external investor, spun off as a separately list, listed business, that can lead to an increase in value for investors. Uh, the, essentially, the, the value of the two parts ending up being greater than when they were combined into one entity. So that's my understanding of, of the basic concept. Obviously, there are there are different um, aspects to it, but on the whole, is is that? Do you share a similar interpretation, or or, or, or do you have a different way to to characterise it? Perhaps we can start with you, Paul. What's your understanding of the the Netco Servco split? Yeah, no, I, I agree to what you're saying. So I think uh, uh, basically, and I think. Uh, one way of uh, looking at it is like you have the Netco Circle, but also looking into the TM Forum definition of how they potentially can split it into like the three parts being infraco, basically the towers and the fiber. And then you have the Netco basically more into the network as a service and the Circle on the connectivity as a service, things like uh, potentially including edge cloud and stuff as well. So, um, so basically there are in, in a view several ways of doing that split uh, of the telco model. And uh, one like uh, as an example of what we do at Telenor is that we split the passive infrastructure from the active infrastructure. Um, but then also, I would say looking into uh, several of our markets where we have uh, joint ventures on the radio access network, which also includes the active infrastructure. Um, so I think how basically to do that split, um, it is really important to look at the uh, the specific business ambitions and market conditions as well uh, to see what out of those models uh, would be uh, the better fit. Okay, interesting. So uh, a third layer, not just Netco, Servco, but Infraco, Netco, Servco, um, and the distinction between passive assets like a, a tower uh, and active assets like um, the electronics in a, in a base station. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, perhaps last year we can get your perspective from, from your experience with Vion. What, how do you interpret this Netco Servco topic? I think you, you mean Lasha, right? <laughs> Sorry, Lasha, yes. Yeah, like, uh, uh, look, first of all, uh, very good discussion and very good topic. And thanks for having me here. And uh, what was already said is absolutely valid. And I'll just uh, put on the last uh, quote what uh, Paul said, uh, that it's very important to look into the market and also to outline what is the goal of the company. Because uh, one of the main reasons why you do it, what is the end game? So you separate just because of the efficiency or you separate because of value creation, because with two companies, as it was said, you look for different type of investors. But there is also one third uh, part in this, what in Vion we do, it's like selling portion of the uh, net cost, tower cost, where you free up the capital through the selling uh, the towers and you can relocate this capital and you can invest more into the service level. I mean, like whether it's like service delivery, AI technology, digital services, just really use these funds to the dedicated service part of your business. 
And uh, this is also one of the good reasons why companies should think about uh, separating uh, Netco and Servco. Okay, so uh, an additional source of finance as opposed to going out and issuing bonds, for example. Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, and Brian, let's get your perspective on this. What's you know, You've heard um, some of the issues there, the, the idea that perhaps there are three layers to this, the net InfraCo, NetCo and ServCo, um, that it's about value creation and also um, perhaps a, a, a more economic way of getting access to capital. What are your own perspectives on this NetCo, ServCo split? I think it's uh, super important to see which markets you do this in. Uh, the large operators like Telnor, Vion, and uh, American Mobile, and so forth, they there's different regulations in different markets, so that has to be in place so you can really do this. Uh, second, yeah, it, it is about, okay, what is your goal? Because you might have short-term goals, which can be freeing up capital. Uh, you get other investors into these new companies you create. You make joint ventures, or you own 100% or 60 or 30, depending how you structure it. But then it's also, and you get it off the books. So if you're uh, if you're measured at uh, EBITDA, then fine, then you can have capex underneath. But if you're starting to work on cash flow, then you know uh, then the capex is important. Uh, but then you can also have it as an opex because you need to kind of like rent back your own stuff after you sell it. Um, and it's also because of different investors in different parts of your company. The ones that invest in your, let's say, your uh, cervical or, or will be wanting a much higher margin because they're used to the EBITDA. So then they're looking at 30% plus margins. But as an infrastructure company, if that is a split between uh, tower and, uh, and network uh, on the passive infra, they can have long-term investors that don't need a very quick return on the money. It can be government investors, it can be pension funds. They are happy with um, five plus percent, right? Uh, or maybe a little higher now with the interest, but still it's a different, it's a different investor portfolio or a different investor group that will be attracted to it. So that these are kind of like, Elements and then the end goal needs to be a little bit more long term than just quick cash. You have to look at it as efficiency, but you can automate it. And the infrastructure itself can also sell other things than just space in the tower. They have uh, they have a lot of different elements, especially now they are close to customers at the edge. And you might be able to find new business models for the infrastructure companies to to rent out other things than just places for our use. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Certainly, there was, uh, there has been a a boom in in infrastructure funds uh, investing in anything from cell towers to wind farms or toll roads um, over the last 10, 15 years. That's been quite a popular asset class, and we did see a lot of telecom operators selling off, in particular, their their towers. Um, and um, potentially as a way of, of raising capital uh, and also to um, to in increase efficiencies. But um, we have also seen some of these big tower companies um, have, have perhaps gone got too big and overstretched themselves and they've actually been having to, to downsize recently. So I think that there's that sort of boom has perhaps um, uh, reached a, 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 a uh, a more um, static point now. So perhaps we're not going to see quite as many uh, of these uh, ta independent tower companies growing up. Um, but let's let's go into the, some of the details about uh, some of your particular businesses and your, your experience. So for example, um, Paul, I know in 2020, Telenor uh, created um, Telenor Infra as a new entity, uh, and that was set up to, to manage and operate passive infrastructure in Norway, things like cell towers, uh, TV broadcasting um, towers, and other real estate assets. 
That's uh, now been renamed Telenor Towers, uh, Telenor Towers Norway. There's also uh, a similar setup in Sweden and, and Finland. And collectively, that's the Telenor Towers division. So can you tell us about some of the new services? Brian mentioned this idea of, of introducing new services using this infrastructure. What are the sort of new services that Telenor Towers has been able to introduce? Um, you know, potentially things like uh, co-location uh, and what sort of new customers it's been able to win as a result of this this uh, transformation into an outward looking infrastructure business rather than just serving your own internal needs yeah yeah so i think uh, first a bit about the uh, infrastructure so it it uh, it manage uh, the passive assets right in in three uh, main areas one is the sites like the building power um, and like the for the, the those part, part of this, this uh, things and the second is the fiber, uh, and the third one is uh, what we call a data center. Uh, and I think uh, for all of these areas, the, the, the key motivation uh, is to focus on what is the utilization of these assets. And then that could be attracting new customers. It could be attracting external investors, as we have talked about. Um, and uh, another important thing is also how to improve the main processes dealing with those assets and uh, managing them. Um, and so I think like in some markets, we have uh, attracted uh, additional customers, uh, as you asked, and into um, into those existing assets, I would say. Um, and that the, the, some examples there are like road authorities. Um, then we have better sensors, uh, local municipalities, uh, and so on, which um, of course increases revenue and the number of customers. And that is great. Um, but I think it's it's important that most of those actual new uh, customers are for the existing products, like we, we talked about co-location uh, or providing antenna slots, uh, indoor space uh, and, and uh, such. Uh, so I think um, looking also a bit onto the data center uh, side of it. Uh, so we have the, the infrastructure companies owning data centers, but also building new data centers. Uh, very modern data centers that are extremely energy efficient. Uh, and for instance, driving the heat back into the, the city and, and stuff like this. Um, and the, the service being offered there is currently hosting uh, both for uh, our uh, serve call, uh, but also for external uh, companies. Um, and then looking at the fiber side of it, I think we we have gotten uh, the external investors uh, as we have reported in our annual report from last year. And that fiber is also being used by um, Telenor, the Telenor Servco um, to provide the communication services, but also by others. Basically, where at least in the markets where we are regulated uh, to, to actually um, open up that fiber. Um, and I think uh, another important area is that we have also uh, advanced our green agenda. Um, like for instance, by uh, uh, over purchase agreements related to windmill parks, uh, both in Sweden and in Finland. Uh, and that's also a really important thing uh, for the enterprise customers and of course also the investors on that side. Uh, but last and also I think like uh, uh, Brian mentioned just about the edge cloud part where the infra company is owning um, a lot of uh, sites around in the, the markets where we operate. Uh, and um, that is uh, an opportunity, right? Both for that we, the or Servco is building that edge, uh, but also for others to come in and put their edge cloud into those uh, locations. So uh, a lot of exciting things. Okay, so the, the three main asset types are the sites and buildings, <clears throat> the fiber optic network, and the data centers. And some of the new customers then, you, you talked about road authorities, municipalities, um, you also mentioned something about sensors or a sensor network. I didn't quite catch that. Could you elaborate? Yeah, so that's basically weather sensors um, around in the in the country or in the geography. So uh, basically, that you uh, we have companies installing those sensors around into the towers or the tower locations, basically. Okay, I see. And uh, the data sensors. Um, you have particularly energy efficient data centers where there's some sort of recycling of the heat into um, being used to, to heat up uh, homes or offices. Is that is that the idea? 
Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And um, and that's serving your own internal services business, but as well as external customers. Um, you know, the, obviously um, nowadays people uh, enterprises are relying a lot on on public cloud. Are the enterprises that are co-locating with with you in your data centers is it because they don't have uh, the appropriate uh, public cloud offering in 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 that part of the country yeah so i think it's still early days the data center is being built uh not fully ready for uh, hosting the customers uh yet uh but uh i think definitely looking into sovereign clouds uh type of uh, solutions or whatever that needs to stay on national soil um and having those regulations like uh, national or um, national autonomy, things like this, or um, basically the sovereignty part of it is important, uh, but also potentially other things. So um, that's uh, open to to serve a different type of customers. Interesting. Okay. Um, and Brian, you're based in uh, in Norway, I believe. Have you um, come across any of the the Customers that are that are using these uh, infrastructure assets from Telenor, are you familiar with any of these use cases? I think the the sovereign uh, cloud part of it is interesting because uh, what the telcos are doing and Telenor included, uh, they make constellations, uh, not necessarily owning it one hundred percent themselves, like she go it in uh, in Norway from uh, from Telenor, uh, which can you know it's. It's a little bit similar to maybe something like Green Mountain and, and other actors that are in in Norway that are they're building a, a data center and they can host anything. Uh, but they they set it up in a way that it is uh, it is sovereign. So then Telnor with their own stuff, I mean the infra will then will then sell this to Telnor or they will sell it to other actors. It can be competitors like Telia. Uh, or it can be media, or it can be anyone, or it can be the municipality themselves, depending what they're actually using. And this you would need to sell to police, to hospitals, uh, to to defense. And I think defense is probably uh, the first interesting thing. Uh, and those clients all over Nordic, and particularly now when everybody's in NATO, there there is some advantages here to connect, let's say, the public network with the private networks that they have and then also with sovereign clouds which are then managed by infra companies because they manage the passive part of it but not the active part so as soon as you from a telco sell something as a solution whatever that, that solution might be and let's say you sell it to a hospital or, or a defense or police or something then then you will you know rack up with the active equipment wherever that might be in the in the um, in the sovereign data center on your edge sites and 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 other things in in co co located or not, and then on top of that, and that is super important when you split uh, the netco and and um, and the infra out, you have to make sure that the platforms that you are having that are being split in two, and we'll come back to that in later questions, but it's just important that you make this available or you build this for the new netco in such a way that is future proof um because there will be new customers there will be new opportunities to sell new services as you combine these different passive elements as a highway for anyone with active so right now we have active players which are the the telcos and the telco b2b but it could be smaller medium enterprises that wants to get into this because they want to be close to a certain customer segment in a city, for example. So uh, there's there's many different business models that can be coming out of this. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Lasha, let's let's turn to to Vion and get your uh, experience here. So as I understand it, um, Vion is a, a multinational uh, operator, and you've been looking to move to a more asset-like business model in recent years, in particular selling off cell towers. Um, and just uh, last November, uh, the company agreed to sell, I think, around a third of its tower portfolio in Bangladesh. And you also have tower companies set up in uh, in, in other uh, countries that you're operating in, like Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Ukraine. So 
what I was interested in is is generally when you when a telco sells its its cell towers onto another company, um, the buyer is obviously hoping to use that site to serve multiple tenants. So your mobile network, your competitors, um, potentially other users. Uh, we mentioned broadcasters. And so they're getting multiple tenants on the same site and getting economies of scale that you as a, as a sole tenant wouldn't be able to, uh, to achieve. So the seller, in this case, the telecom operator, they're, what they get out of it is this upfront cash. There is the ongoing lease expense, but that upfront cash you know, could enable them to invest in, in new uh, activities that generate additional service revenues. Um, and uh, and they're then tied into this long term lease that enables them to continue running the the, uh, the mobile operation. So, you know, in your experience working on these sort of deals, how do you make it work for both parties in the long run so that it's you know, to the advantage of both the uh, the the, the, the netco company, the towerco company, and uh, and the mobile operator who's then having to to partner with and lease from that towerco company for for a long time. Those must be difficult um, deals to negotiate and structure, I imagine. Uh, yes, first of all, as you said, uh, James, like uh, the separation of the tower companies and of course, like as it was discussed now, like further steps towards the infra company. This is just part of our uh, digital operator strategy. Therefore, we of course, first establish the tower companies in our, all our operations. And uh, I want to mention that uh, the idea and strategic shift, it's not about cost saving at all. It's about really creating efficient companies where the specialized forces inside the companies are really taking care of their own P&Ls. And just an example, like about the tower cause, what I was uh, talking about, like when it's separated, then it's more focused, for example, to go in more green or to make the solar power. And it's not about just new clients uh, on your towers. It's about really making the, this business efficient and really driving it to the further to the innovation, plus the collaboration part. It's not about just telcos collaborating and using the same towers. It's about other services as well. And as Brian mentioned now, the edge computing era is coming faster and faster. And to the separate entity, it gives more revenue upside possibilities. Therefore, like it's not initially done because of the cost saving. It's initially done because of specialization and increased efficiency. And of course, uh, what you mentioned regarding our uh, Bangladesh case, uh, like this is one of the goals we are going towards, like specialized companies who do the net core businesses all over the world are really interested to collaborate and buy out like partially or fully your tower companies is it easy of course it's not because uh, we all understand that you have to work, have very strong slas very strong connection with the company and common goals to go forward and of course involvement of the service core in this business in terms of technology advancement whether it's cloudization or next generation of technology you are staying there. But at the same time, we clearly see that dedicated specialized teams or companies are really doing much better on the uh, passive infrastructure side, just as said, just going more green, making the electrification or fiberization of the, uh, of the total network. So it's really efficient to do so. And as said, like uh, first you, you of course establish this company inside, and you make it work properly, and then you go out. And as you mentioned, like with the upfront capital, it's very much easy accessible capital. Let's name it so, which you reinvest then into your core business, where you are completely focused on the digital services. AI, customer experience, or whatever like uh, digital or uh, mobile services we can offer to our customers. Therefore, I would say once again, so it shouldn't be targeted as a cost saving, it should be targeted as an efficient model that all the companies are benefiting from this. This is one and another thing like really identifying, of course, you can keep this company within your umbrella and structure, but there is huge possibility, as we all discussed today, finding the investor, going into the JV, or even selling to specialized companies all this infrastructure. 
I see. So it's not just about selling off towers. It's it's more about creating a, a dedicated organization that's looking after that infrastructure. Could be cell towers, could be data centers. Uh, they've got their own PL, and then they have um presumably the, 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 the right incentives in order to run that particular activity more efficiently than when it was just a um a cost center inside of a larger organization. Is that in essence what we're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. right, Summer. Yeah, yeah. And um I mean is is the uh is the strategy working out um very differently in, in the, the different countries? You 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 operate in some very diverse regions. You know, was there any particular reason why Bangladesh was the first one where the where the some of the towers were sold off, or is it um is it uh, is there no particular pattern? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's uh, like different from country to country. Of course, uh, like today, Brian mentioned very well. So each country uh, is uh, different from its regulation perspective. For example, in some of some of the countries, you even might see that regulators request to have the clean separation between the companies because many regulators are uh, clearly driving towards using the same infrastructure, uh, going uh, and taking more care about the ESG, going green, and etc. But at the end of the day, this is a uh, common pattern that it's really making the telecoms really splitting the businesses and going and showing to the markets several entities which are really specialized. And it's not uh, decisions are not made centrally because it's sometimes really hard to decide on capital investment or whatever when you have to think about like technologies from the, for the future, like Gen AI or these kind of services. And at the same time, you have to take care of concrete and steel uh, to have your infrastructure business up and running. Therefore, like this is very effective and uh, it creates and maximizes the value of us big players of the telecom in the world to really bring more value to the local markets as well. And uh, the business players who are really interested and uh, there are many players out there who really are interested only in passive infrastructure or are interested only on the edge computing and uh, dealing uh, with this and infra and uh, the good discussion about data sovereignty. It's, it's coming in every country and it's great, great potential. Like uh, you, uh, we all use multiple clouds and multi-cloud approach, but at the same time, like uh, delivering with the, in the countries, the new data centers, which can help the SMEs uh, or even large businesses locally. One of the examples we've done is in Pakistan. We, in the last year, we started our cloud business named Garage, which is doing uh, more or less the same what Paul was referring to, like uh, really suggesting different services to the a local community, whether it's government, whether it's big businesses or small businesses. Okay, excellent. I should just remind our audience that uh, there is the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so down in your console, there should be a, a button or a widget that says Q&A. So uh, feel free to submit a question and uh, we'll put that to, to our panelists. Um, Whilst you're having to think about questions, uh, let me turn back to to Brian and get get your perspective um, on perhaps one of the most prominent examples of this concept of the the Netco Servco split. Brian, uh, a few years back now, TDC in Denmark they they created um, TDC Net, the Netco, and New Day, uh, the Servco. Um, and I remember um, almost two years ago, uh, the CEO of New Day was was presenting at uh, Digital Transformation World, talking about you know, the, the the challenges, and and he described the process of splitting up TDC in this way as as quite painful, quite difficult. One of the biggest challenges that he said they faced was their their legacy IT systems that dated back to to the nineteen eighties. So. You know, from your perspective, what what advice would you give to companies that are embarking on this sort of net co servco split? How do they address this challenge of of legacy OSS and, and BSS in order to to take advantage of the these opportunities? No, well, I think um, it's a good example of how not to do it, I guess. Um, but um, this is a moment where you then actually have the ability to clean up some technical debt. And and uh, and you have to have, as uh, as Larsha said uh, uh, earlier here, you have to have a 
clear goal for this company that you're making. And then you have to look at that. Okay, so what is that company going to do? And it has to be, so you have to build the platform uh, and, and renew this stuff. You can't take your old uh, network management systems that you've been using the last 10 years and, and just lift and shift it to a new environment or split it and have it as a double run cost in both environments. You, you need to build that new or not necessarily build it. I mean, buy off the shelf standard uh, things. There's no point developing it. There's enough other industries that have these things. If you look at a power company or a water company or a gas company or whatever, this is infrastructure, it's passive. And the important things is to life cycle your infrastructure on the different life cycle, pending uh, what it is. I mean, a tower can be there for 50 years. And, and also it's workforce management. Maybe one of the things you can save the most on or make it more efficient is you know, automated workforce management. So they don't go to a site that is not ready or they don't go to a site where security doesn't know that they're coming, uh, you know, empty site visits and and uh, and just have an automated generative approach to where do you need to patch and do and open and have assets available, the asset management. These are large areas to be really really more effective than what you were in the past but but i would build an open platform i mean that's what we uh, support from red hat uh, so that you can put third-party applications on it and your own as well if there is some that you kind of intermediate have to have there until you uh, exchange them so i think it's a great opportunity to really modernize your your software infrastructure there yeah one good example, actually, uh, was TM Forum uh, last last year, I think, in Denmark, was um, American Mobile. They showed uh, um, an example from Mexico, I think, where they had uh, done this and they had done uh, this approach uh, in the way I just described, and that is working very, very well. Interesting. Okay. You mentioned cleaning up technical debt. Let's go back to Lasha from Vion. Lasha, as Chief Digital Operations Officer, you must have be you must have come across this challenge of technical debt and, and what to do. What what's been your approach and, and what have been some of the successes you've seen? Um, so uh, once again, this uh, success is uh, really coming only after you outlined what you want to do with the companies. I, I'm saying this once again, but it's very important because when I was saying about uh, cost saving and all these kind of things, that this is this shouldn't be the ultimate goal. When you do the separation and when you do the separation of the services, some might think that okay, now we will combine one team and they can deal with both companies. I mean on the back side, whether it's engineers or uh, other representatives of the software part of the business. But it's uh, in most cases, it's not true because uh, you have to really have the dedicated teams. And on the service serv servical part where you do the customer service, where you do the application, digital services, and et cetera, you even have to increase your development power. Or as Brian has mentioned, despite you can buy some ready off-the-shelf solution, you still need people really to deal with that. And on the tower side, you still need some engineers there to sit and really take care of this, all the changes on the software part, what's happening there. So the, now I wouldn't define success as a, as a one formula in this case, but the key idea is that you have to uh, plan your strategy on that. So what's your ultimate goal? Like uh, where you want to go and then really go after this with the separated P&Ls and separated strategies for each, co each company. Despite some spikes of the cost, maybe on some uh, uh, on the way to, uh, to the success story, at the end of the day, your quality of service, your efficiency and the opportunity for the revenues is much, much higher. And therefore it's worth to do but it's worth to do in a very strategic and very planned way where you really create the new value and maximize the value of the existing assets and not just uh, combining some uh, backend assets just because you want to drive your costs down. Okay, interesting. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we 
We have some questions from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll come to them in a second. Um, but before I do, let me just throw this one more out to uh, to our panel. So any examples that you can share where the Netco Servco model has shown to deliver some sort of new service innovation for, for telecoms, either within your own business or, or externally? So I'll, I'll throw that out to um, to the panel. Perhaps, um, Paul, if I can put you on the spot. So, um, perhaps give us the uh, from internally from Telenor's perspective, or, or anecdotally uh, uh, examples of other companies that you've seen that have undertaken this Netco Servco model, and it's it's led to some service innovation. Yeah, <clears throat> I think. Uh, um, see what I can bring there. Um, I think I talked uh, a bit on uh, the data center part as an example. But like if you like, you might. Have increased service innovation. I would say both on the uh, on the say infra core part and also the net core or uh, the the serve core, right? And I think uh, definitely looking at the infra core. Uh, talked about innovation in establishing new super green uh, data center as one case. Then we talked a bit about the edge cloud, which is still uh, what should I say in the um, uh, not fully there yet, but uh, ongoing. Where we see quite some innovation. Um, so, so those are there are quite some innovation in that space, and obviously there are a lot of innovation happening uh, into the service core. Uh, and I think, uh, like uh, Lasha pointed out, is that really important to get uh, the focused uh, teams into the the serve core and the the infra core part, um, uh, where you have different uh, investment cycles as well. Like uh, Brian pointed out, and that is also freeing up, uh, which I say, and also making it. Um, easier to innovate. So you get more focused innovation when you have uh, a focused business uh, and focused management in that part. And there are quite some interesting things going on. Like uh, one thing is uh, if looking into the, um, as an example, how we offer new type of security products, both to the consumer and to the enterprises um, in the, in, more in the serve call. Um, and then I think other good examples, uh, we talked about Edge, uh, which we have, we have been doing uh, more into the kind of regional breakout, uh, say for uh, what we are doing in, in Finland, so that we break out the traffic to enable like um, ambulances to do a quicker uh, treatment of their patients, taking the, what should I say, uh, the time to start patient treatment down from uh, like uh, more than one minute to uh, down to a few seconds which is quite quite amazing. So there's a lot of uh, good things happening there. Um, I, I guess that would uh, <laughs> desire a completely separate um, uh, a panel discussion to go through all of that. But uh, mm. I think the, the whole point is that we are kind of uh, enabling such innovation by splitting and getting the focused business and focused management. Uh, and also then, of course, more focused innovation, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's that's helpful, uh, Brian. I think you also touched on edge computing earlier on. Is that something uh, you know that you're seeing the netco side of of these uh, businesses uh, starting to deliver? Is it is it becoming a meaningful revenue stream for any telecom operators uh, in your experience? I mean, I'm not inside the telco, so uh, difficult to to say exactly what the revenue streams are on this or not. Um, but they have to find new revenue streams, and and I think it's it's good, uh, as was uh, said by by uh, Lasha here. You have to, they have their own P and L, so you have to put KPIs on it, right? The, uh, and what you measure is usually what you get. And um, what we have seen some interesting things in Europe is where one is actually trying to make a market where you could buy and sell and hedge. Um, space, you could call it space, but uh, it can be uh, actually CPUs uh, available on the on the far edge, because you might have uh, other clients of the of the infra, or there can be clients of the serb code that is actually then using the infra, and there is many different ways of selling it right uh, in 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 what channel you are selling the different things or or what marketplace that you're offering these things but in the end it is the the compute power that are in the racks uh, next to the to the towers now they are uh, they can be you know macro sites or it could be um, rooftops 
or it can be other things. And here you, you can combine all of this through the through the passive infrastructure and make this available to certain bursts in addition to the larger data centers. There's 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 a lot of innovation looking into this. I haven't really seen it in practice of how much revenue it, it generates, but you know, CPU as a service. Yeah, okay, fair enough. That's uh Useful insight, Brian. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay. And, and just to, to add a thing, we, what we are doing with a lot of clients is we're building sandboxes to test this. So uh, we are building those things out and they make them, if it's telcos or others, they make them available to their clients or make them available to, to interesting parties to kind of come in and put their products on it and test it to see how it works. Because this is, you know, a quick failing. We, we have to just start doing it because just there's not one alone that can do this. It requires large ecosystems uh, from, from our side as suppliers, but also from the, let's say, the, the end end customers, depending uh, how far out you go with that, on the people that put the applications and the services to the end consumers, B2C and B2B. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we've got some questions from the audience. Uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, to address. So the the first one says the uh, the scenario that we've described about the netco servco split suggests some additional complexity that you now have to have interfaces between two separate entities. They might still be within the same uh, company. It might not be completely spun off, but nevertheless, they're they're two. Uh, independently uh, run organizations. So is there any need then to standardize interfaces between a, a Netco and a Servco or, or perhaps between a, an Infraco and a Servco or, or some combination? Is there a requirement for some sort of standard interfaces and APIs here? Um, is, perhaps that's something the TM Forum has looked at, Paul. Paul I know you're, you're, you mentioned them earlier. Is this... Um, is this issue of interfaces between the Netco and Servco, is that a challenge you've come across? Yeah, no, I think it's a good, very good question and extremely relevant. Um, and I would also point to TM Forum uh, on, on much of that. And it depends a bit on like how that split is done. So if you have, uh, you talked about these three potential layers, right? What is it only passive versus active or is there something in between the Netco and, uh, and the Servco? And I think it's, it's a good question because um, uh, different systems and uh, processes uh, basically would reside in the different companies. And that I think TM Forum, especially, uh, and uh, TMF open APIs, uh, like for instance, if you have a, say, BSS type of system sitting somewhere in the Servco, communicating with some OSS in the, the Netco to kind of exemplify a potential split uh, where you use the, the standard APIs like the. Um, TMF 641 on the service uh, uh, ordering API or uh, catalog management APIs and those type of things. So definitely, I think that's important. Uh, and then maybe also looking into, uh, what should I say, things coming up with um, uh, the Open Gateway Initiative, uh, Kabara type of standardization on that layer. Uh, I think it's also important um, into that split. Uh, but then also, if you go to the lower split, uh, obviously, uh, from the passive to the active, um, I mean, there there might be some uh, relevant parts to standardize there as well, uh, depending on who is doing what, right? Uh, is there any active equipment at all in a, like uh, the, the, the infra company, or uh, is that fully passive? And do you need to uh, relate to which should I say proprietary APIs? Uh, maybe you would like to open it up uh, with uh, like uh, uh, Brian mentioned a bit about the servers and uh, the racks and how you potentially could leverage things like Redfish or uh, stuff like that. So there's all this type of uh, layers in the stack that needs to be kind of uh, put into or considered when uh, when doing this. Thank you, Paul. Lasher, did you have anything to add there on this? topic of APIs and integration between the, the bits of the business that you separated? Uh, look like uh, nothing specific, just I would like to also to echo Paul, like uh, it's always, of course, it's always much better to have a standardized uh, open API approach, but I would say it's not a showstopper. It's a very important part, but it's not a showstopper. Uh, because there are like, and Paul just mentioned several, like starting from Tamara up to many other, 
uh, interfaces and open API uh, approaches between uh, the companies. So you can always use it. You can always add it to this. Going to the standardization, of course, makes for the big groups, it's easier because when you have this path to go in many countries with many operations, of course, like it makes life easier for the any future movement. But uh, the major thing is that this is very nice to have and makes things easier and life easier, but it shouldn't be a showstopper uh, you know, when defining the strategy, what you want to do with all the uh, assets you have within one umbrella today. That's all I wanted to add. Okay, thanks, Lasha. That's that's helpful. Uh, we've got another question here from the audience, uh, Lasha, that I think it's 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 um, sparked by some of the comments you made earlier. So the the audience uh, member is asking, what financial metrics or models are you using to evaluate the success of telco investments in digital ventures? compared to traditional telecom assets so i guess they're asking you know are there are the um are the metrics uh different for infrastructure investments versus digital services investments uh, and uh, any expectation on share of revenues coming from these digital services compared to traditional connectivity so uh, i think um probably quite quite small today i'm not sure if if you break out any sort of digital services revenue in your financial reporting but anything you can share on 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 that would be uh, would be helpful uh firstly james we do uh because uh as i said so we uh are focusing and delivering on our digital operator, operator strategy for three years already and uh, within the group, we already achieved around 10% of the revenues coming from the digital services which we created and which are implemented in the countries. And I, I would say for in the future, this portion will increase. And I'm not talking just only about my group, the young group right now. I think overall in the world, this will change that the portion of the digital services will take more and more portion into the revenues. As about uh, KPIs and investment part, of course, this is matter of approach from the start and type of the digital service you launch. Definitely, there has to be ROI calculated and some expectation. But of course, we can't compare 101 because people here who are from the telecom world, we all understand that when you uh, start your base station and sell your first gigabytes or minute, you immediately get the revenues. So like this is different uh, kind of a business animal there. But with the digital services, first, of course, you work on the MIUs, my monthly active users, engagement rates, or watch time, or whatever. And then you go into the monetization model, whether it's on top of your telecom services or standalone uh, subscription packages. But definitely, so I wouldn't say that starting any business, whether it's physical or digital, you should start it without any financials. But of course, there is a difference. Somewhere you uh, want and you look for the quick return based on the specific of the business. And for example, like telecom, as I've said, and in some of the digital space, of course, you have to wait and invest first and really engage the community to use these digital services and then uh, go back to the business model, which we which you initially wanted as a monetization of the model. Excellent. Okay, well, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but thank you very much for sharing those insights. That was Lasha Tabitze, Group Chief Digital Operations with Vion, Paul Gronson, Director of Cloud Strategy and Architecture with Telenor, and Brian Klafstad, Global Account Manager with Red Hat. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your thoughts on integrated telco versus the Netco Servco model. Yeah, that was great. And James, thank you.